Good morning, everyone. My name is Donald Maynard. I am the head of public affairs at the United States Consulate in Sydney, Australia. And I'm very, very happy to welcome you all to today's edition of Diplomacy Delivered, the future of democracy in the Indo-Pacific. Um, and just as a side note, this, this particular session is um, near and dear to my heart uh, because we have with us uh, Dan Twining from the International Republican Institute. And I had uh, the pleasure of working very closely with IRI uh, when I was posted in Baghdad, Iraq in 2008, 2009, uh, visited uh, all over the country with the country director of IRI as we were heading into the first uh, provincial elections in Iraq since the 2003 invasion. And uh, I just can't say enough about the work of IRI and the other organizations that were there in Iraq working with the Iraqi parliament and, and with the public uh, to move towards um, uh, full participation, democracy in the country. Um, so Dan, thanks, thanks for the work that you and your colleagues do. This morning, it is my pleasure to introduce to all of you Ms. Alex Oliver of the Lowy Institute. Um, Alex is going to do an introduction of, of Dan Twining in just a minute, but Alex is the director of research at the Lowy Institute where she's responsible for the Institute's team of experts and directs the research program. Until 2018, Alex uh, directed the Lowy Institute's program on diplomacy and public opinion, including uh, the, the very popular and well-read uh, Lowy Institute poll. I have somewhere on my desk three years of copies of it that I use as a common reference on, on a weekly, if not daily basis. Alex's other research interests include Australia's diplomacy and diplomatic infrastructure, uh, consular affairs and public diplomacy. Um, before we turn it over to Alex and Dan, uh, a little disclaimer, Diplomacy Delivered is supported by the United States Embassy and the United States Consulates General here in Australia. Um, however, our speakers' views are their own and reflect a broad range of, of responsible and informed opinion uh, of and in the United States, but neither of our speakers today speak for or on behalf of the United States government. All of their opinions uh, are, are their own. Uh, so now, uh, as the government spokesperson here, it's my job to get out of the way and let the conversation begin. So I'm gonna turn over to you, Alex. Thank you very much, Donald. And um, thank you very much to the US Embassy for putting on this very valuable diplomacy delivered event and series and for inviting me to moderate this conversation with Dan Twining, who I'm absolutely honoured to share the stage with, the virtual stage with today. Um, I'm pleased to see that there are audience attending today from around Australia and as far away as Washington, DC. I hope we can keep you awake over there. I know it's going to be late in the evening. Um, welcome to members of the Diplomatic and Consular Corps uh, here uh, and, uh, and abroad, including Australia's Consul General in Houston, Texas, um, I believe is um, on the line, to the alumni of the US International Visitor Leadership Program, which is an absolutely fantastic program, which has in fact produced some of the world's great leaders in Western democracies, uh, to members of the Press Corps and other distinguished guests. You're all very welcome. Um, now, Dan is going to kick off for us today with some brief remarks um, about his works and his thoughts on this topic of, of democracies in the Indo-Pacific. Of course, the Indo-Pacific um, is, is a region now that is reshaping our thinking about global geopolitics and has become increasingly important as an organising principle for our thinking about international relations generally. So, Dan. Over to you. Okay, thanks, Alex. It's such a pleasure to be here with you. Uh, uh, I really am grateful to our friends at the U.S. Embassy in Canberra and the U.S. Consulate in Sydney. Uh, I've had the pleasure over the past decade of doing several speaking tours that they helped organize for me across Australia. Uh, I have such fine memories of so many excellent Australians all over your country. Uh, in different phases over the past 10 years. And I'm just sorry not to be there with you tonight, but hopefully soon. Um, so thanks for the chance to do this. Um, I'm just gonna share some thoughts about democracy in the Indo-Pacific. And naturally that's going to include uh, kind of our own democracies and what we need to do as Australia and the US uh, as part of our alliance, not just of interest, but of values. Uh, first, maybe just a quick note about uh, the International Republican Institute, uh, 
Uh, we're part of the National Endowment for Democracy, funded uh, primarily by the US government uh, through various competitive mechanisms. Uh, there's a sister institute, the National Democratic Institute, and other core institutes of the NED. Uh, this group was set up 37 years ago in bipartisan fashion by the Reagan administration and the Democratic-led Congress at the time uh, in the belief that uh, democracy in the world uh, was a global public good. It was good for American security and prosperity, uh, but it was also something that America should invest in uh, for its own sake. So we work around the world to help support democratic practice, to help build strong parliaments that can conduct effective oversight, to help marginalized groups participate in politics, women, youth, other groups that aren't as heavily represented as they should be, uh, to uh, help strengthen political parties. Our belief is that democracy doesn't work without strong and competitive political parties that stand for agendas, not personalities. Uh, to help foster vibrant civil societies that can contribute to democratic practice in bottom-up fashion, uh, and to uh, nurture strong governance institutions. We do this work all over the world, including in uh, almost 20 countries in Asia. Uh, we have done this work with the support of the Australian government in countries like East Timor, Timor-Leste, in countries like Indonesia and others in your neighborhood, which we really value. Why does democracy matter? It feels like uh, we're back to first principles with many things these days. Um, but perhaps I could just remind us for a few quick seconds here. Um, first, uh, and in no particular order, it's the surest source of prosperity. Um, every rich country in the world is a rule of law society, unless it happens to be sitting on a giant oil or gas field in the Middle East. Uh, democracies have discovered the secret sauce of how to uh, produce uh, wealth, even if that wealth is not always equally distributed. Uh, so democracy produces prosperity. Democracy produces peace. Democracies don't fight each other. The best alliances are among democracies like Australia and the US, whose people share common bonds uh, that isn't simply about uh, the bonds between a particular uh, leader. Uh, democracy is the surest way to advance whatever your cause may be as a citizen. Uh, it may not be democracy in the world. Your cause may be racial justice. It may be climate change. It may be inequality. Whatever your cause that really motivates you in the public domain, uh, you are much more likely as a citizen to be able to organize and affect political mobilization and change around that cause in a democracy, for sure, than you are in a dictatorship. And of course, democracy matters because uh, rulers don't get to rule forever. In fact, they rule under extreme checks and balances. I mean, you're seeing a lot of that in America right now. With regular elections, powers devolved at different levels of government. So uh, democracy is able to refresh uh, itself to self-correct, to course correct, to be much more resilient, the kind of brittle uh, one-man authoritarian system. We uh, think democracy matters. We know that in theory. Um, Authoritarians these days uh, would have some of us believe that actually uh, autocracy is more stable, right? Uh, that democracy is very messy. Uh, that it is uh, suboptimal in its ability to bring people together and produce public goods. Uh, that it is susceptible to polarization and infighting and extreme voices, right? Uh, that may or may not be true, but shouldn't confuse uh, the superficial stability of an authoritarian regime with everything we don't see in that country. Just to think about the United States, you know, we've got a very vibrant free media reporting on everything happening in our country. That's not true in China, where the government has kicked out almost every credible international reporter. Uh, the COVID pandemic, uh, countries like the US, other big democracies, India, Brazil, don't look like they're handling it so well. And that is true. Uh, we know that partly because uh, that is public news in the public domain. In China, it was not in the public domain. Uh, but in fact, a repressive authoritarian system uh, persecuted anybody who wanted to warn the world about the COVID pandemic early this year. Shut down all debate in the media, in the medical community in China, uh, among Chinese officials. Uh, in order to protect the reputation of China. 
So you don't see a lot of what goes on in authoritarian systems in the way that you do in a democracy. Um, I would also just like to point out, because it's, I think it's close to many of our hearts, what's been happening in Hong Kong just in the last few weeks. Hong Kong looked a lot more stable to most of us when it was a free and open society governed by the rule of law and independent institutions uh, than it has for the past year or two as the Chinese Communist Party has increasingly choked off and constricted and narrowed so much of the space for dissent and free speech and peaceful organization. Hong Kong is far more fractured and far more unstable today as a result of the political crackdown of the Chinese Communist Party. So uh, I think there are many of us in countries like Australia, in countries like America, that do take our democracy for granted. Uh, one, because it doesn't always work brilliantly, and two, because of course we haven't come up in any other system. I will tell you at IRI, we work in almost 100 countries. People all over the world are desperate for the rights and freedoms that we take for granted in open democratic societies like Australia and the US. They are desperate from Hong Kong to Belarus, to Sudan, to Venezuela. Uh, people are out there in the streets fighting for what they believe in. That includes in Russia, that includes in Belarus, uh, that includes in so many countries where the, the terrain is not ripe, Algeria, Bolivia, uh, that have much more complex legacies. Um, people who are deprived of political liberty, political freedom, the right to a voice, the right to a choice, actually crave uh, what democracy has to offer them. I think often more than people I meet in the West who just take so much of these uh, rights and freedoms for granted. Uh, we've seen authoritarians use uh, the COVID pandemic for sure to crack down on democratic practice, on democratic openness, to essentially weaponize the public health emergency, uh, to prosecute their political opponents, to shut down critical media, to uh, ban independent civil society groups that might threaten their political primacy. So we're living through an era that is uh, uh, reflected not only in a public health crisis, but very much a political crisis. And it's quite interesting to me, authoritarians care about democracy, we know, because of the ways they assault and subvert it. This is also true in the great power domain. Of course, you all in Australia uh, have a, a very uh, uh, accurate eye for what's going on with China and in that relationship. Uh, China, frankly, in my view, and we can talk more in the chat, um, I would argue the Chinese system has abused the Australian system's openness uh, to spread forms of malign influence, uh, to uh, weaken Australian democratic institutions. Your institutions are strong. Your leaders are pushing back. There is a natural citizen and political response to uh, malign forms of authoritarian influence. But we've seen it not just with China in Australia. We see it with China in dozens and dozens of countries. We've seen it with Russia in different ways in dozens of dozens of countries that great power authoritarians have defined a strategic interest in weakening democracy and in weakening the bonds that hold us together as small d Democrats in our societies because that kind of polarization and division serves their particular agenda, right? Which is to build out their own uh, spheres of influence to make the world a little safer for autocracy and their systems. So uh, as we think about the future of the US and Australia in this Indo-Pacific region, uh, you know, I think increasingly there's a view in the United States that that means free and open nations concerting together to provide public goods, to provide common security, not to form a containment coalition against anyone, uh, but that in fact, uh, the kind of security contestation that we see out there today is not just about something happening in the South China Sea or something happening way off in this or that island chain. It's actually about whether uh, our people in our societies are free to make their own choices without a foreign hand, a malevolent foreign hand, attempting to limit or influence those choices in malign ways. Uh, through disinformation, through misinformation, and other forms of information operations, through media penetration, through various forms of corruption, overt and covert, through united front tactics, through the kind of disinformation you've seen coming out of the Kremlin for many years. So uh, there is, I think, increasingly uh, a recognition that democracies need to work together.
uh, that we share common values, but also that uh, the world we've built, this free and open Indo-Pacific that we have sustained, that has been the source of our common prosperity and security is under great pressure. That we're in a real geopolitical moment uh, in which uh, not only interests but also values matter in uniting free nations and free peoples. And to come back and just to kind of close out a little bit, um, that means we have some work to do, not just in our alliance, not just in our diplomacy, but some work to do in strengthening our own democracies, making our own democracies more participatory, uh, making sure that uh, our elections count and that it's our citizens that determine their outcomes, not foreign powers, uh, really trying to optimize our democracies uh, to make sure that uh, foreign powers cannot take advantage of our internal divisions. And we have them in all of our societies. They're amplified by social media. Uh, but really for us to realize that part of our competitive advantage in a world of greater great power competition, part of our competitive advantage as Australia, as America, as other friendly open allied nations is actually our political model and the fact that our citizens are vested in it, our citizens have a central voice in it, our leaders are accountable and representative to them. And that's just not true uh, for the case of our geopolitical competitors. It also puts us on the right side of history because people all over the world, again, crave this democratic ideal that we take so much for granted in many ways. Uh, of course, we have a lot of work to do. You know, in the United States, we've been working on building our democracy for almost 250 years. And as you've seen on TV, with uh, some of the racial justice protests, with a lot of the political divisiveness, we have a lot of work to do, uh, which is why we're having elections and why we have checks and balances and a multi-party system and devolved forms of federal government, just like you do in Australia. Democracy at the end of the day is a system. It's not about a man or a woman as the leader, but it's very much a system uh, and in which uh, the people are sovereign. And that really is what distinguishes us. And I think what will continue to distinguish America and Australia and our many other good friends and allies in the Indo-Pacific in this era ahead. Uh, so let me just uh, stop there having put a few things on the table and I really look forward to the conversation with you. Thanks, Alex. Thank you, Dan. Um, that's a magisterial overview of, of the role and value of democracy in the world, not just the region. Um, just a couple of housekeeping issues. Firstly, um, I'm sure in this um, COVID world of shutdowns, you're all intensely familiar with Zoom, uh, WebEx and the various um, tricks and functions. But if you would like to submit a question to, to Dan, um, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen and um, I will be attempting to sort of sift through those and, um, and get to as many questions as possible uh, a bit later in the, in the session. Dan and I, um, I, I would like to ask Dan some questions myself. So we're going to have a conversation for 15 or so minutes and then open it up to, um, to a general conversation with you as the audience. Um, uh, Dan, I want to ask you first, if we could go broad uh, just for a minute. Um, you talked about your, your, you know, America's friends and allies and like-minded nations in the region. I was wondering if you could give us a quick sort of status update on democracy in the region. Um, Freedom House, which I know you'll be familiar with, has been mapping the global progress of democracy since 1973 and its Freedom of the World Index. And this year found the 14th successive decline in global freedom. Some academics have called this a democratic deconsolidation, but, but it, it's well noted that there are few democracies in Southeast Asia, which is what Australia are near region. Uh, you've mentioned the, uh, the issues in Hong Kong and the erosion of the dramatic erosion of freedoms there. But we have in the region countries like Thailand, Vietnam, Myanmar, Cambodia, Singapore, who are either not democracies or have very few democratic freedoms. Even Malaysia is not designated a democracy by freedom of the world. So in that context, you know, what, what can the established democracies in the region, such as the United States, Japan, India, and Australia do to arrest the slide in democratic freedom? Should they even try anymore? You know, in the Cold War, the aim was more about exporting democracy or promoting the soft power of democracies. Is the aim now more about balancing and defending against non-democracies rather than attempting conversion or promoting further democratic freedoms? Yeah, thanks, Greg. So, um, look, uh, there's a question about the starting point. I mean, I agree with the Freedom House assessment that there has certainly been democratic backsliding, it's obvious. Uh, 
Uh, but look, when the National Endowment for Democracy was founded in 1983, Taiwan was a military dictatorship, South Korea was a military dictatorship, Japan had never had a transition of power, uh, Indonesia was a military dictatorship, uh, Bangladesh was a military dictatorship. I mean, I could go on and on, right? But we have seen major, major gains in Asia over the last two generations for sure. And what's striking about Asia is that it's the most prosperous societies that, of course, became the most successful democracies. I mean, very much led by Japan, but including South Korea, including Taiwan. Uh, obviously, the Indonesian transition was so important and strategic in the late 1990s. Uh, many countries remain a work in progress beyond those. Uh, Malaysia, uh, uh, you know, it had its first transfer of power in uh, six decades, uh, two years ago, for the first time, right? So uh, continuing problems there and in many other countries. Uh, part of, I think, uh, the analytic issue here is that all of us watched the Berlin Wall fall and we thought that's, that's what happens when you have a democratic revolution. Actually, most of the time it doesn't work that way, right? Most of the time it's that steady state work of building up the foundations of democratic institutions, democratic principles, a culture of democracy, and it takes generations, right? I mean, look at Burma. Uh, it, 10 years ago, we all would have said, gosh, if you could end military rule there, uh, everything would be possible. And here we are with the Nobel Peace Prize winner in charge, and it's still very, very complicated. So uh, this is a long-term effort. It's a bottom-up effort, not a top-down effort. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, I know what Asians want. Asians want to live in free and open, prosperous societies that are not corrupt. We know that from Lowy polling, from all sorts of public opinion polling that nobody wants to live under a co corrupt autocracy where the leaders steal public funds and self-enrich and operate in dynastic fashion. I mean, nobody wants to be North Korea, right? So um, the other fact here, uh, despite the uneven picture, Alex, is that of course, uh, just because of the size of big countries like India and Indonesia, more people in Asia live under democracy than in any region of the world. So while the picture is very mixed in the Indo-Pacific, uh, from a numbers perspective, uh, it's not as if there is an absence of demand for democracy. What people want is for democracy to work better and for democracy to deliver. And frankly, that's often where it falls short, particularly in Southeast Asia. Um, very interesting question you just asked, you just posed there, um, saying that nobody wants to be North Korea. And, and that leads me into my next question. You've talked about the values, um, the shared values in alliances um, and the strength of the US alliance system across the world is phenomenal and one of its greatest assets. Um, Low Institute polling has found that one of the primary attractions of the, of the ANZUS alliance to Australians is the shared values and ideals. But what about the prosperity and democracy equation, which I think you touched on earlier before, um, nobody wants to be North Korea, North Korea, but what about uh, other slightly less dramatic versions of, of totalitarianism or authoritarianism? If you look at some of the benefits that an authoritarian capitalism has been able to deliver in terms of prosperity, China is obviously the primary example of that. Um, compared with an earlier period of communism where the appeal was ideological rather than economic, um, in those earlier periods of communism, there had been hope that democracy would follow prosperity, particularly in the early 2000s in China. Uh, do you see the appeal of an authoritarian style of capitalism on the rise or waning? In China, for example, it's been able to deliver hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. Is this something that is peaking and will now, and, and the attraction of that increased prosperity will now wane? So I think we just need to get some facts in order. I mean, I'm very sensitive to this argument. I've heard it many times. Per capita income in China today is about $10,000. Per capita income in countries like South Korea and Taiwan is four, five, six times that, right? China's way, way behind in terms of producing prosperity for its people. Uh, the Asian development model actually had lots of East Asian societies that started out looking quite a lot like China in terms of authoritarian capitalist development they transition to more open systems, to more open uh, politics. Uh, 
again, Japan, uh, South Korea, Taiwan, etc. cetera, uh, uh, because at a certain point, a complex middle-class society that actually is producing real economic innovation is just impossible to manage under one party, one man rule. I mean, that, that, that actually is the lesson of the East Asian miracle over the last 40 years. Uh, China has defied some of those trends so far, but in fact, I would argue is just at the beginning of the zone in which some of those uh, forces of gravity begin to exert themselves. I'd also just make another point, which is that the citizens of Hong Kong are five times richer than the citizens of the rest of China. And guess who has been uh, uh, most vociferously and bravely and fiercely fighting for democratic rights and freedoms? The citizens of Hong Kong, two million of them were in the streets a year ago. Uh, this month, right? So they don't buy the argument that there is a more successful authoritarian capitalist model out there that we should all somehow defer to. Their argument is that actually successful advanced development, complex development that produces really prosperous, successful societies does not work unless you have rule of law and independent institutions and property rights. So funnily enough, there's a part of China that proves, I think, the rule and we'll see what happens. Mm. Um, well, you know, I like to be a devil's advocate, particularly in a discussion like this. Um, not going to let you get away with anything, Dan. Um, I think we need to talk about young people uh, when we talk about democracy. Um, no Institute polling, which actually mirrors uh, questions asked by the Pew Research Organization in, in America, which has done global polling on, on this issue. 65% um, of Australians say that democracy is preferable to any other kind of government. That's a slightly lower number than we would have expected from one of the world's longest continuous functioning democracies. 22% um, this year, last year actually said, in some circumstances, a non-democratic government can be preferable. But the number for younger Australians is slightly lower. And in fact, in the last few years, it's been considerably lower than that, with as low as 39% in 2012, saying that democracy uh, was, was uh, preferable to any other kind of government, a very low result. We've seen similar trends, or the Pew research has found similar trends in other established democracies. What, what do you see as the drivers of this? Um, you know, the apathy, disillusionment with the workings of democracy, attraction so, to a more authoritarian system of government, uh, and, and how do we address that as mature democracies? Uh, part of what we need to do is get greater youth participation in politics, for sure, which includes voting. I mean, it, I, it's different in Australia, but in America, young people vote disproportionately, just massively, massively less than old people, which of course is ironic because it's young people who have the biggest stake in the future and the decisions that elected leaders make. It's not successful old people who are prosperous and have made it in life already. It's people coming up. So uh, participation in politics, uh, youth engagement in politics, I think is part of it. Um, another part of it, I think, is just some broader historical knowledge that I think is lacking, certainly with my children, uh, about uh, what the world was like uh, before uh, in 1989, about what it's like to live in a police state, where because of something you might say on social media or something I might say right now, secret police could come to my house and take my family away or disappear me. Right? Um, nobody who's answered those polls uh, who is disaffected with democracy, I believe, has had an experience like that. And I say that again because we sort of work with the opposite, which is people in less democratic societies, less than democratic, who are just hungry, hungry, hungry for basic rights and freedoms. So I don't have a perfect solution. I do think it would, you know, if going back to this point about optimizing our own politics. Um, that getting our democracies to work a little better and be focused on issues that young people care about uh, is part of the solution. Um, but again, uh, democracy as a system, its virtue is not that it produces great superhuman leaders. It clearly doesn't. Its virtue is that leaders are accountable to people and responsive to them. And if young people organize and mobilize and vote, political leaders will actually be responsive to them and their issues. Yeah, well, part of the issue, as you mentioned, must be in civics education. And I think that's probably um, something that um, as Australians uh, are considering at the moment. Uh, we have parliamentary visits programs for young people. And I think there's more, more of that um, in, in our established democracies uh, can only be good. Um, I want to talk about the impact of the coronavirus on this because we can't have an event um, at the moment without looking at 
the effect of the COVID-19 crisis on this. You talked about the messy operations of democracies. And I guess the, you know, the, the example of China and the apparent effectiveness of its response, if you believe the data um, coming out of China as having been you know, a, you know, perhaps some attraction to a different system of government in responding to a crisis like this. You said, and you agreed that open democracies, some of them have been hit hard by COVID-19, although, of course, Australia has fared better than most. Um, how do you strengthen the ongoing case for democracy um, to polities, domestic and foreign, in the context of a crisis like this. We've, we've done some recent research actually, which has shown that democracies were not significantly better performing than non-democracies when you look at the six key measures of the COVID response. Middle powers were in fact much more effective than great powers in doing it. So how do you see COVID as, as affecting, I guess, the case for democracy in the West? Great question. So uh, I will say, as somebody who lives in a country that's really stricken, uh, that has the largest number of cases in the world at the moment, that I'm glad I live in a country where uh, I can vote for political leadership uh, and that politicians are going to be accountable, not just politicians like the president, but governors, mayors at all levels, that citizens are going to uh, hold politicians to account. I mean, some have performed very well in our system, certainly in our federal system. So uh, I'm also glad to live in a country where the media is able to so free and completely and openly report on all the shortcomings. That's very helpful. That doesn't happen in closed societies. I'm happy to live in a country where independent institutions uh, can make a lot of the decisions around public health, right? Again, the US uh, hasn't performed optimally at all. Uh, you know, I think there's probably an inverse correlation between uh, uh, kind of American rugged individualism and some of the medical, the group medical measures necessary uh, to contain the virus. But in short, I mean, Alex, I want to go back to something you said. Um, uh, some of the countries in, in the world that have been most successful in handling the pandemic have been democracies, uh, like Taiwan, uh, like South Korea, like Germany. Right, uh, and so I would never, I, and you haven't, but I would not buy the argument that somehow autocracies handle it better. Um, it's rather ironic that the Chinese have managed to convince so many people that they're a great success story uh, since this started there. And the Chinese doctors who wanted to warn the world uh, were silenced. Uh, the Chinese journalists who wanted to warn the world were disappeared, right? So uh, that does put a different gloss on it. We've discovered in the past week that the face masks many of us uh, uh, have imported from China are made in uh, forced labor camps in Xinjiang. Uh, we also just know some facts, which uh, you know, democracies don't propagandize the way autocracies do. Uh, US is the largest international health donor by a factor of five. In the last year, in the 2018-19 cycle, the US gave 10 times more money to the World Health Organization than China did. But the Chinese somehow have turned uh, a pandemic that their system uh, started there and that their system did not warn the world about. Uh, they turned this into a propaganda victory and it's very vexing. Um, we have a serious public health crisis on our hands and we'll see how countries come out of it. I mean, I don't think the last chapter here has been written in terms of the economic and social and political recovery. Yeah, well, the propaganda machine out of China is obviously a formidable thing, but it may have backfired um, in its aggression with the, with the wolf warrior diplomacy that has accompanied um, talk about the pandemic response, the, the sources of the pandemic, the misinformation that has been given out even by senior Chinese officials um, about uh, the coronavirus may well backfire, which leads to the next um, topic which I think is very important when talking about fortifying democracies and that is the issue of disinformation in an era of, of um, ubiquitous social media. Um, articles in an a April issue of foreign policy outline the dangers of disinformation campaigns on democracy, 
arguing that democratic institutions have not kept up with the problem and they've deferred to tech firms such as Twitter and Facebook to referee online behaviour. The Cambridge Analytica scandal, which showed how big data could be used to manipulate particular demographics on behalf on behalf of political actors. And then there was a revelation just this morning that the United Kingdom government had failed to inquire into Russian disinformation during the Brexit campaign and in fact took no steps to prevent it at all. What do you see as the role of disinformation? You briefly mentioned um, the Australian problem and, and we can talk later about the Australian response to that if you like. Um, but what do you see about the role? How, how, how much of a problem is it what can we do to address it, um, particularly when a lot of the information takes place over privately owned channels, such as the big social media organizations? It's really, I think, really the biggest question in our politics. And we should start just with the proposition that democracies are uniquely vulnerable because we have these open systems, these open debates, these open platforms, and authoritarians have weaponized them against us, foreign authoritarians. Uh, you saw this in the 2016 U.S. election. You've seen Russian election meddling all over Europe. Um, uh, it's a fundamental problem. It is uh, made much, much worse by social media and the fact that it's hard to know uh, on Twitter or Facebook or other platforms whether you're actually interacting with a live human being or whether you've got an army of bots or trolls uh, being pushed uh, by a foreign intelligence agency. You mentioned earlier in the different context, Alex, civic education. I think a lot of this is not going to be a government effort uh, to somehow build a, um, a bulletproof surround over our societies. It's impossible in the information space. A lot of this is gonna have to be citizens being educated and aware enough to understand the difference between something that appears in the Sydney Morning Herald or the Australian or on ABC on television and something that they see on social media that is unverified and that may be coming from abroad. So I think part of the response, frankly, needs to be at the level of citizenry, including education for students in schools about how social media can be weaponized and how to separate kind of truth and facts from fiction and propaganda. It's a very hard question um, I don't think our politicians, frankly, have a lot of the answers. The U.S. tech companies have had to walk a really fine line on these issues. It's, it's been hurting them lately. Um, I, I'm hoping that just the fact that we are much more aware of the problem means that uh, there will be much more focus on addressing it. But I'm afraid I think it's something we're going to have to live with. And part of building democratic resiliency in a great power competition is going to have to be, frankly, to harden ourselves a little bit to be able to navigate these information domain uh, uh, contests. Big challenges indeed. Um, now it's over to you as the audience. We've had some questions which arrived um, actually before the event, which you kindly submitted, and I'm going to get to some of those now. And just remind you to use the Q&A function if you would like to, uh, to ask Dan a question. I'm gonna start with one of the questions that came through um, before the event um, started today. Um, from Oliver Bojews, I hope I've got that right, Oliver, um, over in Perth, who's one of our, um, uh, one of our special visitor um, leadership alumni, I believe. Um, Oliver asked, considering recent events in the region, the, the Golan clash in the, in the, on the Himalayan border region, um, the, the Hong Kong issues, the, 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 secu the new security law, he asks if the US-Australia alliance is more imperative now. And I would add to that, Dan, um, that this actually highlights, you know, perhaps the value of another, not technical alliance, but certainly a grouping or a cooperative, cooperative grouping in the Quad, which, which of course includes uh, United States, India, Japan and Australia, all coincidentally or not coincidentally, um, very established democracies in the region. So do you see those recent events um, which have been pretty dramatic in the region, and we might uh, we might see developments in Taiwan as well, which would be extremely worrying. Do these make um, alliances more imperative than ever? They do. They Thanks do. for the smart question. Uh, they do, and I think sort of the the uh, Alex Oliver addendum to the question is quite important, which is that the Australia U.S. alliance is necessary but not sufficient. You need more. 
Uh, you need the US and Australia working very intimately and interoperability and interoperationally uh, with countries like Japan and India uh, and uh, others. So uh, part of what's happening here is that, uh, look, the Chinese system doesn't respect the rights of its own people. Why would it respect the rights of other countries, right? Uh, when people say, oh, it doesn't matter how a country governs its own people, the nature of a regime, all that matters is how it behaves on the world stage. In fact, Chinese leaders are aggressive and assertive abroad because they are aggressive and assertive at home uh, and domineering. And the intention is to dominate the neighborhood just like the CCP dominates Chinese society. They're not separate things, they're part of the same approach. And so now that I think many have opened their eyes to this fundamental reality that China had effectively cloaked for many years uh, until Xi Jinping, the question is, what do we do? Uh, and we know the answer, which is that the Chinese love to deal with countries one-on-one. -on -one. They love to get, for instance, the ASEAN Southeast Asian countries, not as ASEAN, not as the 10, but alone one by one and pressure them for concessions uh, to step back on this or that issue. Uh, we know uh, that you know, a China-Australia bilateral conversation is going to be different than say a US-Australia-China conversation or a quad-China conversation. So let's find strength in numbers. Let's find uh, courage in the fact that these open societies share a really fundamental interest in free and open sea lanes, in free and open societies, in uh, the sovereign integrity of borders uh, uh, and uh, peaceful resolution of conflict rather than the kind of unilateralism we've seen in the South China Sea and in so many other places. Um, uh, let's work together. And again, that's not uh, some kind of counter coalition. That's not a new Cold War. That's protecting what we have, which is uh, a foundation uh, in the Indo-Pacific that has created the world's greatest economic miracle in human history. Let's protect that. Um, I, I've got another interesting question. So I'm going to shift gears a little bit to this, um, to respond to this question from Bronte Mullane um, at Griffith University in Brisbane. Um, and she asks how the US and Australia are responding to both the shifting nature of terrorism and the prevalence of threats amidst COVID-19. So we've talked a lot about the threat from non-democracies in terms of states. What about non-state actors? Um, and, and looking at how COVID has actually accelerated, I think is the word that um, counter-terrorism um, experts, that, that, that's the way that they refer to what has happened under COVID-19 is the acceleration of terrorism, the rise of new forms of extremism. Um, where does this fit in, in your calculations about democracy and the way that democracy needs to evolve? So, uh, you know, it's different country by country, region by region, but we know a couple things. And I suspect the questioner knows a lot more than I do. So I, I wish I could be listening to her. Um, but we know that a lot of people, often majorities now of extremists are recruited online, right? So uh, that's one. Uh, two, we know that uh, many extremists uh, are generated in societies where they don't feel like they have an opportunity, a voice, uh, prospects, and so they find, uh, they find meaning in extremism in ways that they wouldn't if they lived in a prosperous, successful, established democracy, and uh, they had a track into a successful middle-class existence. So uh, inclusion, issues of inclusion uh, matter, uh, making sure that, you know, whether you're talking about Burma or Bangladesh or Indonesia or wherever it is, that you have political systems in which people feel like they have a stake and a voice and can participate. Uh, it includes uh, uh, obviously governments that act within the law and within the rules and governments don't abuse their security monopoly uh, they don't weaponize security against opposition in ways that drives people to the political extremes, that political opposition can happen peacefully uh, rather than political opposition having to happen, happen, happen through violent means or on the fringes. Um, uh, I mean, another thing we've learned about the terrorist threat, Donald was talking about his fine work in, in Iraq, is that it metastasizes and grows and it's not a geographic-based thing. 
Um, it's not as if you can solve it in Iraq uh, and then it pops up in Syria. So uh, at the end of the day, governance does matter. Good and effective and responsive governance does matter. And successful for societies produce a lot fewer uh, extremists, violent extremists. We know that. So let's invest in building successful societies. We're never going to effectively stop every act of terrorism, but let's invest in building successful societies that are well governed and where people feel like they have a, a voice uh, and some prospects. Just to, just to follow up on that question, um, one of my colleagues, Lydia Khalil, has been writing about accelerationism um, in the context of terrorism and the rise of extremism. And then, of course, there is the, the rise of far-right extremism, which is something that, that occurs and, and, and is occurring in established democracies such as Australia, uh, New Zealand, um, the United States that seems to have been exacerbated by COVID-19. Is that something that you've about, uh, concerned about? Um, how, do, how do democracies deal with that sort of extremism, which is of a different character? It's of a different character. I, I mean, in terms of the things I'm most concerned about in the world, that's not in the top five list. Of course, we're all concerned by domestic extremists uh, on the right or left who revert to violence in any society, for sure. Um, for sure. And uh, the COVID pandemic, uh, because of some of the government intrusiveness that we have seen to try to protect public health, has uh, brought some of these uh, groups uh, to the surface. So uh, part of this, um, to me, part of this, again, is about having successful, functioning, inclusive, uh, responsive politics that at the end of the day, people are going to accomplish their objectives by participating in a peaceful political process, not uh, rebelling against the system, that it just doesn't get you anywhere. I'm gonna shift gears again back to, um, back to the, the territory of, of democracy and freedoms and rights, which are an, an intrinsic part of the democratic picture. Um, Alexander Davis asks, um, in countering propaganda from autocracy, autocracies, should we be shaming such autocracies for their human rights abuses? And I imagine Alexander has in mind uh, Xinjiang, the Rohingya, um, rights abuses now in Hong Kong. Um, he points out that while democratic countries' human rights records are not perfect, they're dwarfed by the crimes of autocratic states, both historic and contemporary. Is, is shaming of human rights abuses the way to go? I mean, they, Australia, the United Kingdom, the United States have certainly been vocal in responding to the situation in Hong Kong and the introduction of the new security laws. Yeah, great question. We have to stand up for what we believe in and not be shy. Um, I, you know, there was a period, just thinking about, say, the US-China relationship over the past 20 years, there was a period in which we took a lot of those issues off the table. Uh, because the Chinese told us, if you take these human rights issues off the table, we'll have a peaceful and constructive and successful and stable relationship. Uh, we took a lot of them off the table and we don't have a peaceful and constructive and successful uh, relationship uh, that is stable. In fact, we have the opposite because they felt like they could act with impunity. I think part of what we need to do is help people inside these societies, in China, in Russia, in Iran, understand the crimes of their own governments against their own people. So there's certainly a naming and shaming thing that we should do, including at the United Nations. And by the way, if you look at like the United Nations Human Rights Council, some of the greatest human rights abusers in the world sit on it uh, because autocrats have taken advantage of multilateral institutions at the UN to try to uh, protect themselves from international pressure. So there's a real naming and shaming component. One thing we know is more successful. I mean, we have learned something over the past period. Um, you know, uh, the U.S. Uh, created this Magnitsky Act to sanction Russian officials uh, who had uh, committed just gross human rights abuses against uh, a Russian lawyer, among others. Uh, we now have the U.S. Congress has passed global Magnitsky authorities, which allow the U.S. government to sanction uh, senior government officials in countries where there is clear and unequivocal evidence of gross human rights abuse against their own citizens. And these are powerful things. They prevent you from traveling to the United States. Uh, 
Uh, they prevent you from using uh, the dollar and the US financial system, which is global. Uh, leaders we know are afraid of global Magnitsky. We know because of the way Kremlin oligarchs lobbied so vociferously against them, among others. So I think countries like Australia, the US, we can think a little more smartly about our toolkit when it comes to not just speaking out about human rights abuses, but actually doing something uh, about them that doesn't target entire populations. Of course, most Russians, most Chinese don't support the human rights abuses we have seen, but that targets particular leaders who are culpable. And of course, Australia is considering its own um, Magnitsky-style sanctions regime with a with the parliamentary committee. I think currently, um, or just about to report back on its recommendations on that. Um, I have a question from Brett Osler um, about soft power. We've talked a little bit about soft power and the inverse, I guess, propaganda. What soft power tools do you see as being critical in the coming decades for the Indo-Pacific region? And where do you see global frameworks such as the Sustainable Development Goals heading? Um, so we're getting into the issue of development um, and democracies and the soft power that that, um, that can engender. Great question. Thank you for opening a new front. Um, uh, so in terms of the SDGs, I mean, I think what's happening now is that there's a contest underway in the development space over what is appropriate development. You know, there is a Chinese model in Africa, for instance, uh, or in Cambodia or Sri Lanka or some other excessive cases uh, that is associated with very high levels of debt, high levels of leverage, the need for governments to forfeit physical assets, trophy assets like uh, ports, harbor facilities when they cannot repay punitive debt terms. Uh, there's often a high degree of corruption associated with some of these dealings. So part of, I think, what we need to do, uh, Australia, the US, other big and open development donors, is to help countries develop in the right ways. And that's not just the hard infrastructure of roads and bridges and stadiums, which is uh, what the Chinese offer. It's also that soft infrastructure that really is what makes development possible. That's the rule of law, that's property rights, that's open contracts that are public, public tenders, not closed door dodgy dealings with shady characters, with links to foreign governments. Um, so helping countries undertake the right kind of development uh, and that institutional underpinning to make sure uh, that those development dollars actually serve a public interest in that country, not the private interest of a few politicians, but actually serve a public interest. I think the US and Australia have a lot to deliver, to offer there, and that includes in the digital domain. We think of development as kind of a bricks and mortar thing. In fact, a lot of this is very much about digital standards. Um, uh, the Chinese built the African Union headquarters in Addis Ababa. It turns out they bugged it so comprehensively that it's essentially unusable for any secure work. So what kind of 5G systems and other IT systems that countries import uh, from development donors really matters? Uh, not just to uh, the next few years of economic growth, but really to what kind of uh, whether what kind of information space, whether they are able to have a free and open internet, a free and open information domain in those countries. Um, so I think there's a lot of work for countries like Australia, the US, Japan, uh, Europe, major development donors to do here to help countries get it right and to create incentives for China to get it right. China's a major development donor as well and is learning some lessons itself. <laughs> Uh, yes, China certainly is a major development donor, and and uh, we've we've definitely noticed that in the Pacific region, where it's it's um it's having some real influence, including in term in in um, convincing some of the Pacific nations, which were among the few um, diplomatic partners of Taiwan, to actually switch their diplomatic allegiances, um, and that. That links to another question which I have here from Niranjan Shanolika. Shanolika, I'm sorry if I've got that wrong, Niranjan. He's based in Dubai, actually. Um, he asks what are global democracies doing to promote democracy in China? Uh, and he notes that many seem to be just interested in reaping economic benefits. Well, it's a very interesting observation and it's something that we have done some work on when looking at public opinion in Australia, because of course, China is the major trading partner of Australia and has been since 2009. Um, 
China is actually the largest trading partner of around 60 countries in the world, according to other of our research. Uh, and for two thirds of the countries in the world, China is the larger trading partner than the United States, which is a complete reversal of the situation just 20 years ago. When we ask Australians, uh, who I think for the last decade or more have felt that China was more on the side of economic, economic opportunity than any sort of threat, but when we ask them this year um, that question, whether they, how they view China in terms of the threat opportunity balance, um, for the first time, it, it is seen more as a security threat than an economic benefit. So that's one gloss on that question. But, uh, but back to the original thrust of the question, which is what are Western or established or global democracies doing to promote democracy in China? So it's a great question. You know, for many years, I mean, I used to work on trade. I worked at the US Trade Representative's Office in the 90s. And the argument from the Chinese then was that doing business with China, it's just business, right? It's not politics, it's just business. That was the proposition that Chinese made to the world. And it was a very successful proposition. Uh, the world's great manufacturing companies all opened up in China, ran production lines, global supply chains, recentered around China and kind of that giant factory that it was uh, 20, 15 years ago, that's really changed. And it's China that has led the change. Um, uh, you know, exporting as a proportion of GDP in China has gone down as the Chinese internal consumer market has grown so fast. So China primarily now produces for itself, not the world. Uh, companies increasingly, including a lot of business leaders I talk to from Europe and Asia and all over the world, uh, see acute levels of political risk from doing business in China, which doesn't mean that they don't want to work in China or sell to the Chinese market, but that, that as Alex suggested, that, that kind of um, that cost-benefit analysis has swung in the, in the direction of costs and their political costs, their risk uh, 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 margins. Uh, so you see businesses decoupling in various ways and diversifying production lines outside of China. Um, I mean, one thing to note, Alex, and we talked about this before, uh, China's not the world's biggest foreign investor in many of these countries. I mean, to take Australia, the US, you know, I think is 25 times more invested in Australia than China is. So it's a bit of a 19th century, and I'm not accusing you of this, but you know, this idea that we look at trade flows and that that's the nature of economic mm -hmm. intercourse between countries. In fact, foreign investment flows are usually, um, because they are so enduring, are really, I think, the most, uh, uh, most revealing indicator of the intensity of economic connectivity between two countries. The fact that China buys a lot of Australian iron ore um, is meaningful, but it's not everything. Um, China a lot of students to Australia. I mean, one thing to think about, too, is that trade and investment involves not just uh, buying and selling products. It's very much about services. Australia is an education superpower uh, as a global provider that way. And so I think my bottom line is that everybody's going to have to navigate these issues. The Chinese economy is going to be one of the biggest economies in the world for the rest of our lives, no matter what happens in Chinese politics. And uh, I think what we see from uh, you know, Australia on is that countries wanna have a healthy and open economic relationship with China. They do not want that to be commandeered for political purposes. They don't want what you suggested with the Pacific Islands to happen, which is that China suddenly starts leveraging its economic relationship to demand they make political choices that their people don't wanna make. And I think that's what countries are going to need to guard against in this new era. Um, you mentioned um, Australian and the, the US uh, foreign direct investment stock in Australia, which, which you're right, is many times more than China. And that's a common misconception, I think, of Australians. That it is not just about the trading relationship, but the investment relationship, which is worth trillions. Um, in, in this year's Lowe Institute poll, we got the most unanimous response we've ever had in all of our 16 years of polling. And when we asked about attitudes towards China, 94% uh, of Australians agreed that Australia should work to find markets for Australia to reduce our economic dependence on China. So certainly for Australia, the, um, the equation is changing and for one of the, the most dependent countries on trade or exports to China, that's quite an astonishing result. So uh, I'll finish on that. I notice we, we are right out of time. Um, Dan, thank you very, very much for
your time and your wisdom and your incredibly astute and revealing responses and in the discussion today. Um, thank you very much to the US Embassy for putting this event on, for inviting us to participate. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you all who are listening still or watching still um, for your excellent questions as well. It's, um, they really add something to the conversation. So thank you all. And, um, and I think from, from the US Embassy, I think tune into the next Diplomacy Delivered event. I'm sure they'll let you know when that is. Great, thanks everybody. Enjoyed it. Hope to come back soon. <laughs>